I'm Melissa Owsley with the Minnesota Orchestra and your classical NPR. I'm in Denmark, and I've been spending time with Thomas Sundergaard at his seaside home and in the city of Copenhagen. I can't wait to share with you our conversation and for you to see many of the important places in his life. We met Thomas in Copenhagen at Tivoli Gardens, one of the world's oldest amusement parks. So we're in Tivoli and we're standing by a statue of a violinist who is also a composer. Tell me a little bit about him. Yeah, this is H.C. Lumpy. Most Danes really know this composer. He wrote loads of gallops, waltzes, amusement music for this park. And actually up here on the balcony, you can see one of his most favorite tunes. All oh, Danes I see would, the little gold notes on the Exactly. Pants. All Danes would know this tune, and it's always played around New Year. And this is the concert hall, speaking of this This building. is the concert hall in the background. And this is actually, in this hall, I tested what it meant to be on the podium as a conductor. It's a very, very early memory. How did you do that? <laughs> so I was playing in a chamber orchestra here, and I remember everybody from the orchestra left. But I was looking at that podium and I thought, I wonder how it feels to stand up there and actually have that view of all the musicians. So I went up and tried and stood there and something happened in my really? system. Yeah. So it's a, it's a special place for me. When did you first come here as a kid? I must have been just under 10. And I went here with the marching band and played in this garden and we're given, of course, one of the things you get around the wrist uh -huh. for free rides for the rest of the afternoon. Even coming here, it was as a musician. They yeah, got you in the gates, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it took me everywhere in the world, <laughs> uh, the music, uh -huh. and it still does. Yeah. Thomas Sundergaard has conducted orchestras, operas, and ballets throughout Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand for decades. To find balance, Thomas and his husband Andreas retreat north of Copenhagen to their seaside home, high above the Kattegat. As you get here, can you kind of feel the notes falling off of you as you yeah. <laughs> get closer? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. The scores are yeah. left on the street yeah. behind. <laughs> but also I've studied some of the most important uh, premieres here. Before I did Mahler's second, I remember sitting at the table over here and just looking at this. The sea is so important for me. I love swimming in it actually all the year round and so does Andreas. But honestly, with all the travel and all the pressure to be in a job like a conductor, this is really needed to go up here. You see the lavender uh, around the house here, the roses. It's gorgeous. What made you choose this spot? I think what it's all about is the silent part of it. And it's so calm up here. You sleep very, very deep mm -hmm. because there's no noise. That's such an interesting answer to me that silence is so much a part of it because you spend so much of your time listening. Yeah, and it's said many times, but music comes out of silence. And if somehow you're not nervous of the em emptiness, the, the, the peace and the silence, I think you actually create art much nicer and a place like this helps uh, anyone to be reminded of that. This area is meaningful to Thomas and his husband, Andreas Landen, a professionally trained baritone from Kalmar, Sweden. Thomas and Andreas were married nearby in 2022. Years earlier, while Andreas was studying at the Opera Academy in Copenhagen, they met at the Royal Danish Theater. We were doing a New Year's concert and he was at the side for one of the rehearsals and I didn't have to play for quite a while so I put my sticks down on the timpani and went to the side and had a little chat with him and uh, I remember thinking he's very very nice but he's probably not interested in men. We uh, chatted a little later and then we found out that we actually had a lot to talk about <laughs> and there we are 23 years later. 
Thomas's love of music and journey to becoming a musician began several hours to the west in Jutland. I grew up in a smaller city called Holstebroken. It was a center for art, actually, for music, for theater. The library was a place where I came a lot because I could look into scores, I could listen to music, and I would sit there for, for many hours when I've done my homework. There's a beautiful church where I was baptized in the middle of the city, also where my parents got married. Tell me a little bit about your childhood home and your family. Were your parents interested in music? What was that like? I'm forever grateful for my mom to sing when I had to sleep. And she has a beautiful voice still. But in particular, when she was younger, it was so pure and always in tune. My uncle was the person that got me really interested. He had some drumsticks at my grandmother's home a Friday evening, and he taught me a few things of, of how to use these sticks. I know your father died when you, you were quite young. Yeah, I was only 10, mm. so that's very young. Mm -hmm. And my sister was three. What was he like? My father was, as I remember him, very warm, a good man, someone that would really gather the family. I realize now that I'm growing up that we all have our things in our lives to deal with and you have to uh, gather the forces and try to look forward and believe that the years to come will bring something much better than what's just happened. When Thomas was six years old, he was watching a parade with his parents and was swept up in the moment as a marching band passed by. It's so clear to me still one day that I, I really just ran away from my mother and father down in the pedestrian street next to a beautiful sculpture, two walls in blue where water would run down. There I remember very clearly that I saw the marching band and I ran away with them. They couldn't find me and I was so taken about the sound so I explained to them later on that I would love to be a part of that. So they immediately investigated and got me into the music school. Very quickly, I found out that I loved music and I was very good at it. So the teacher really nurtured me. I quickly got through to some of the bigger ensembles in the music school. And by the age of 15 or 16, my teacher there made contact to one of the percussion players in Copenhagen that also previously had studied and grew up in Holsterbogen. He took me under his wings and then little by little I got to know people in Copenhagen. I got into the academy and I got into the European Community Youth Orchestra and there something started. Without it being really present that I wanted to conduct, mm -hmm. I just wanted to dig deeper into the music when I saw what was possible. In 1992, Thomas began his career as a timpanist with the Royal Danish Orchestra and performed here at the Royal Danish Theatre. When I was 18, I was lucky enough to actually get a job here. So this door is a door that I walked through I don't know how many thousands of times and it really was my home from I was 18 till I started conducting. Wow. So let me show you a few things. A lot of memories in here. Yeah. We looked at art and old photographs, and Thomas reminisced as we made our way through the hallways backstage. In here, I stood for hours. There was a, an old telephone. That's gone now, but actually the telephone the book, telephone is, still, book is, still is still there. there. And I phoned many colleagues just to try and convince them if they would like to play for me so I could train as a conductor. Yeah. Thomas is deeply connected to the Royal Danish Theatre's old stage and the rich history of the Royal Danish Orchestra. Here is actually drawings back from 1448, where the Royal Danish Orchestra was established. 
And this makes the Royal Danish Orchestra the oldest orchestra in the world. Of course, it's not a symphonic orchestra by this time, but there are member numbers back from this time of the orchestra. And maybe the most famous member of the Royal Danish Orchestra is Carl Nielsen. He was a violinist in the orchestra for a long time, and he also conducted the orchestra. His number is 657. My number is 959. So I'm 300 numbers later than him. But it's really interesting uh, to be part of an orchestra that dates back so, so long. And in this very room, I've sat for many hours with a great view of, of the square uh, and practiced quite a lot. This is my first teacher that I also became my colleague in this orchestra, Søren Monner. And round the corner here is the steps up to the pit and into the sacred room. Here was really where I had the first experiences of music and theatre. You can see here we have Schiller, Shakespeare, and Mozart is on the other side here. So it was, it was a place that was created for both opera mm -hmm. and play theater. That's what the Royal Danish theater consists of. It really has all the arts. Up here is the Royal Loge, where the queen oh, wow. sits and her family. Mm -hmm. And she's still very, very much interested in both ballet and opera. So when I played in the orchestra, I don't know, twice a month, Easily she would come to the theatre and look at what we were doing. I'm just looking at this gorgeous theatre and I imagine that your earliest memories of it are probably pretty vivid. They really are. Coming from a little town of just 40,000 people, arriving here in the capital and seeing a building like this and feeling the magic, the history in the seats, in the room. And I remember so clearly, it's one of those moments in my life where I just said, I will do everything it takes to come and play here every day. And um, I ended up playing in that corner of the pit for 16 years. With the opening of the Royal Danish Opera House in 2005 came new opportunities for Thomas. When the visions opened up for a new opera house in Copenhagen, I had a feeling that something important could maybe happen because uh, I felt more and more ready to actually ask other conductors if I could assist them. And so did I do with Michael Schönmann, that was the music director of the opera by this time. And I ended up assisting him on a wonderful opera by Danish composer Paul Ruders, Kafka's Trial. I actually was offered to take over the whole production, and that was really when this place opened. Thomas's conducting debut attracted the attention of many. Little by little, I ended up by some of the most important and great orchestras in the world. Thomas Sundergaard has served as principal conductor for the Norwegian Radio Orchestra and the BBC National Orchestra of Wales. He has made numerous appearances at the BBC proms and made numerous recordings. Thomas is currently serving as principal conductor of the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. And now, Thomas Sundergaard is the 11th music director of the Minnesota Orchestra. It is such a complex role to be able to listen to what comes towards you, but with a lot of knowledge of what's in the score and what you hear and see is written on the paper. And the person in the room that needs to be able to operate that to a better or to a different result is the conductor. And you need to have so many different skills to capture the interest, the respect from the musicians, to take them from one place to another. Does that just come naturally to you? <laughs> it seems like it does. Well, it's probably a, a mixture of many things, but it's also having the luck to sit in an orchestra for so long. So that's why I'm so grateful to the Royal Danish uh, Theatre, to the Royal Danish Opera, because uh, I learned so much in those years. I saw so many wonderful things happening between conductors and orchestras and singers. I guess being in the room for so many hours and absorbing that has changed me as a musician.
One of the beautiful things in my job is to work with many different people, soloists and ensembles, because they are all so different. But one of the absolute biggest privileges is when you get to know an ensemble well, because you can then really dig deep. And when I feel that there is an ensemble in front of me with a gathered experience and a gathered joy, like the Minnesota Orchestra, that when that meets my experience now as a 53 year old, uh, something really beautiful uh, emerges from that. So in many ways, it's just a perfect timing, definitely for me, and I hope so also for both the Minnesota Orchestra and all our wonderful audiences. <laughs>